You're listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Folks, we are back on Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall, and I'm very happy to bring back to you Jan, who is a client of mine that has stood up with bravery and said, you know what? I will share my story. I am going to share about the satanic ritual abuse I endured, the programming that I was subjected to, and the work of Jesus Christ to set me free from my past. And we have recorded two podcasts so far, of which many of you have had quite a bit of positive response to. And, you know, I, I, I'm just so happy, Jan, to bring you back on Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Really good to be back with you again. Jan, I, I just want to say, you know, as we're about to get started here, you have a unique perspective on, on the, a, a number of things in this conversation, uh, the conversation of programming, uh, especially because you were born around the time that a lot of these CIA programs were kicking off in the early 50s. And so you have experienced a, a cascade of things that were being developed and executed by various government agencies to program pe- this, the population. And also, you've experienced both seeking help in the secular world and the Christian world and the failures of both. And on that, I, I want to give you some time to talk about that vantage point and especially focusing on how it was for you looking for help and where things didn't go quite right. Yes. Thank you, Dan. Um, it seems like my, my history, my timeline, parallels the history of mind control in this country, going back to, I was born in 1949. And um, in 1984, I got my first memories of sexual abuse. And that's just about the time Oprah started talking about sexual abuse and the nation had to kind of come to terms with that was actually a, a phenomena that was going on in our society. And uh, about 1990 is when I met all my parts. And that's when the first books start coming out on MPD and, and uh, what they used to call the DID. And uh, it was in 95 that I became a Christian and the Lord really started interceding on my behalf and bringing deliverance and healing um, to me because really I had not gotten that far with uh, secular counseling or in the church. So uh, really my history is the history of a lot of other people in this country that came out of these government mind control programs and came out of ritual abuse, which has been uh, prolific in our country for a lot of years. So what were some of the ways that, I mean, specifically secular counseling let you down? Well, the first time I encountered secular counseling was when I was um, when I crashed and went into the hospital in '84, and they had a they had a sexual abuse um, uh, program at that time, which was they were sort of forerunners in that I think really for that time. And then I was in secular counseling with a psychologist for six years, weekly and uh, really struggling. And at the end of that six years is when I met my parts. And uh, that was a new, a new thing in the world of psychology. And so when I started taking all my notes into my psychologist, he, um, he said he thought the jury was still out, <laughs> but he would you know, travel down that road with me if I wanted to go down that road. And so uh, it was only a few weeks after that that I encountered my dad that I'd been estranged from for six years. And one of my parts came out and challenged my dad. And he was, my dad, I think, was trying to bring me into line uh, with the occult uh, program. And I ended up crashing again because I got into so much fear 
uh, of what he was going to do to me. And so I ended up going to another hospital, a regular mental health hospital, private hospital. And um, while I was there, um, they, they did have some uh, groups for um, really more sexual abuse than anything. But my doctor, my psychiatrist that was there, uh, had studied under uh, a pretty famous doctor at that time and who was studying uh, MPD. And so he started doing sodium amytal interviews on me. And uh, the sodium amytal interviews, I was, I was very dissociative um, as far as uh, the dissociation didn't show up on the scales, on the tests that they gave me. So because it wasn't showing up on the scales, he wanted to really get into my subconscious. And so the sodium amytal is like a truth serum. And um, so it's administered intravenously. And he was able to go in and start talking to my parts. And then uh, the next day, I wouldn't remember anything when I woke up at all. Mm -hmm. The next day, then um, um, the nurse, while the interview was going on, the nur a nurse would be there and she would be uh, taking notes for me. And so the next day, then the psychiatrist and I would go over the notes. And there were little bits and pieces of things coming out. And as they came out, I'd think, well, I, I remembered that. I mean, to me, it was putting it into my conscious mind as if I'd never forgotten it in the first place. But I think there was another layer of information that was coming out that he wasn't bringing to me by notes. Hmm. And I, I kind of know this because we had a, we had a um, temporary nurse there on the ward and she pulled me aside one night and asked me about uh, a ritual where I was made to kill the, my first baby. Oh my. And it wasn't in my conscious memory yet. And so it came into my conscious memory once she spoke it, because I believe it had been processed in that Amatol interview. So I never saw her again. I think she got reprimanded for that. But, but the, the, the sodium Amatol interviews were good in that I was getting a lot of emotional relief because the doctor was, um, you know, exposing this, history and uh, memories and so forth, but I wasn't getting any cognitive understanding really of my history and what was happening. And um, he was he was probably a Christian or probably would have claimed to be a Christian, but he really didn't know anything about deliverance and demons. And so I was told much years later that during one of these interviews, um, a demon came out and spit on the doctor. Oh. Which ended up being our last interview. <laughs> now I didn't know this at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but my one of my parts, John, told me about this actually just pretty recently. And uh, John got the blame for it because John was the one that the doctor was working with at the time. And of course the doctor I don't think had any you know, concept or framework to, you know, understand a demon and what a demon would do. So John was the part of my system that was assigned the job of committing suicide. If we ever needed to do that, he was the one to do it. And all the other parts in my system were assigned the jobs to keep job John from doing that. So that day when the demon spit on the doctor, John, the, John asked for more Amatol to go deeper because he was the one that was reporting back how deep we were in the, in the session and it caused, caused just to overdose. <laughs> oh my. I slept from like 10 o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock that night. Oh gosh. <laughs> so that was our last Amatol interview. But, um, but that was helpful. But it really wasn't, um, it wasn't therapy and the doctor knew it wasn't therapy. And so um, when I, I found out that the man that I had been in counseling with for six years was reportedly in some of our cult meetings and I, I had enough information just to not trust going back and doing any more counseling with him. So I quit that counseling and went forward with the psychiatrist. And uh, so that, 
I think I worked with him for about a year outpatient. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of that year, my husband uh, got cancer and ended up dying. Then just within three months, he was gone. So everything switched from working with parts and dissociation and memories to processing the, the, uh, you know, just the emotions and the healing and all that from my husband. And so, and about that same time is when I, I came to the Lord. My aunt cast a demon out of me one day and led me in the sinner's prayer. And I agreed to accept Jesus and about 200 of my parts did not. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a shaky beginning <laughs> for my new life. <laughs> now, what would you say were some of the responses that you ran into for any nurses or those that heard the kind of trauma that you were describing in these interviews? Well, it was, it was really interesting being on this uh, psych ward of a private hospital. And um, I met people there. I met one woman there that just was going from hospital to hospital having um, shock treatments so she wouldn't have to remember her past. I mean, she flat out did not want to remember. And she was a neighbor of mine. I didn't know her before I went to the hospital. But her dad walked in one night, and I recognized him. He was a cult member. He was part right. of our coven. So, I mean, that was just, but they didn't, the, the hospitals didn't recognize it. So they were just giving her shock treatments, you know, to forget. I, had, I met one guy that came in, and he was going from church to church telling them that he had demons, and they were sending him back to the psych hospitals. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I had nurses that were trying to talk me into becoming a Wiccan my and gosh. trying to give me crystals so that I could remember my history. These are nurses on the psych ward. Um, there, you know, I was probably one of the first ones to go through that ward that actually had DID and that they were, you know, working on. In fact, I was in a support group of maybe oh, eight, 10, 12 people. And the only other woman in that, in that group that I really related to was one that had come out of the mafia. Her dad was part of the mafia. And I really related to all her stories. Mm. But yeah, it was hard. It was hard because there weren't that many people that were being identified, I think, as having DID, although probably a lot of them did have. So, so um, my gosh. <laughs> The wild world. That, that's the, and then that's the thing, right? Much of the church, I mean, has been pretty challenged in the area of helping people with complex problem sets. Uh, and, and, and I mean, I've met, I've been in these churches where a person has a prom, complex problem set, the pastor refers them to a psychiatrist. And many times the psychiatrists are not saved. They're just the most credentialed help in the area, you know. And so the Christian goes and, and, you know, they end up on drugs. They end up in different kinds of therapies or this. And it's like, you know, that's what the church has offered to people for, for, for decades. You know, now there's been a bit of a more, you know, proliferation where more groups are stepping out into the deliverance field. But largely, I mean, it's just been very unfortunate and sad. But let's come back to your situation because you had just received Jesus, 200 parts didn't. And I think that's a gross underestimate, <laughs> you know, based on what you've probably learned since then. But, you know, okay, whatever. A lot of them did not. What happened next? I have to totally agree with you on that because that was just my front row of parts. <laughs> <laughs> the, the back rows and the deep rows, I don't think even got a, 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 they probably didn't even know what was going on really, frankly, at that moment. At the moment it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, my husband passed away and um, I, 
my aunt had led me to the Lord, but um, I wasn't really um, going to church. I wasn't, I didn't know what, I, I had no idea what Christianity was all about and what that meant. But, um, but I bought a church. <laughs> I, sold, I sold my house because it was too much to take care of after my husband died. And I bought this, it was a Ukrainian church slash school, rather large building. It had been empty for a number of years. The Baptist church had owned it. So I purchased it for them thinking I would make a big luxurious apartment in the, in the sanctuary on the second floor. And I was in business with a couple women uh, making crafts. And so we were going to have a shop and, and, uh, work areas on the second floor and then uh, the basement had a baptismal and a kitchen so it was just a good building to work and work and live in and so um i moved into this building and my brother who was a christian but had not been going to church for years and years and years invited me to go to church uh, at christmas time and we went to a medium-sized assembly of god church and um, it was wonderful. It was a, it, maybe about 300 people, 350, something like that. Beautiful, wonderful church, wonderful service. And um, in the, at the end of the service, there was this hush that came over the crowd. And I didn't know what was going on, but it, there was just a silence that you could just feel. And I knew it was God. I knew God was in the room. Hmm. And this elderly gentleman he was a black man he had a white beard and hair he wore a black suit he was very distinguished looking he stood up and started praying uh, singing amazing grace in tongues and the whole place was just i mean the silence his voice god's presence it's like in my heart, I'm like, Lord, I want that. Whatever that is, I had no idea, but I wanted it. <laughs> so I, I started going to that church, and um, there, they had a singles group. I joined that. The pastor was doing a discipleship course. I joined that. And my favorite thing was that there was a, a prayer group that met every morning at 630 in the morning, five days a week. And I joined the prayer group. And there were maybe six, seven people there normally. There was one guy in the group that I actually shared some of my history with because he was a friend of a, another friend, a woman friend of mine. And there was another guy in that group that was very quiet, uh, never really said too much, uh, kind of mysterious, really. So um, I was enjoying church and being a part of that church and getting to know people and just growing in the Lord and, and living in the sanctuary of this church building that I had bought. And I was attending a, a group, a, a support group, secular support group in the city, 75 miles away. So one morning I got up, got ready to go make the trip to the city, to the support group. And I just had this foreboding feeling mm -hmm. and I didn't know what it was. And I, I just prayed and asked the Lord for protection that I needed protection. I didn't know what I needed protection from. I, I think I asked for angels. So I'm driving on the way to the city, listening to secular music on the radio and I start singing and I'm aware that there's two angels in my back seat. <laughs> <singing. laughs> like, oh, well, this is strange. And so I start singing in tongues. I didn't even speak in tongues yet, but I was singing in tongues all the way, all the way, 75 miles. Wow. So I got to my group meeting and I walked into the room where we normally had our meeting. I've been going there for months and months and months and months. And this day when I walked in, the Lord opened my eyes and I saw demons from ceiling to floor. Whoa. On all four walls. 
They look like bats just hanging in cluster everywhere. They were everywhere in this room. And I, I just freaked out <laughs> like, oh my gosh, what is that? And so I left the building. I just started walking around the block and praying. I'm like, Lord, I don't know. What is this? What do I do? What do I do? And I heard him say, leave and don't come back. <sighs> I'm like, I had already agreed that I would give six weeks notice or something if I ever left. But the Lord said, leave. And I knew I had to leave. So I did. I went back, got my purse, said goodbye, walked out, drove 75 miles back home. And that was the end of the group meeting. And I found out later that the woman that, that was the psychiatrist or a psychologist that did the group was uh, secular. And she was dealing with a lot of survivors, but I don't think she knew how to pray or cleanse the room. And so all of this was just demonic debris that had, you know, accumulated. 100%. Wow, you know, and that is so. I'm, I really appreciate you sharing the story. This is something that people don't understand. First of all, there is an overlay on the physical 3D world that is spiritual. So everywhere you go in this physical 3D world, there is a spiritual overlay. Now, you don't necessarily see it with your physical eyes, however, if you have either a the discerning of spirits in operation or on the other side of the uh, conversation in the kingdom of darkness if you have your third eye activated and open which we don't do at bride ministries uh you will see that overlay you, you'll see the spirits that are there who's hanging out who's not and uh, from one environment to the next you will see different occupations of spaces and so the lord here clearly opened your eyes jen as to what was going on in that room now whenever there are survivors that have heavy duty cult programming all gathering in one place it's very typical for their parts to also be active in the spirit realm in the overlay around that area and, you know, people's parts may, you know, join in confederations with each other, or they may get in a big fight, or they may, you know, do witchcraft together. Like, it's literally meeting outside of people's bodies in the spirit right next to them, but you don't see it with your physical 3D eyes. And so putting a number of survivors in one location is always a challenge. Now, for a ministry like ours, we understand the challenges. People... You know, they come into our ministry and suddenly we give them prayers like freedom from human persecutors and freedom from human persecutors 2.0 and gang stalking prayers. It's like these are the tools that we have for facilitating a healthy spiritual environment in perpetuity. Many Christian churches have become completely defiled because a cult will say, let's have 10 folks from our cult go to the church all at the same time. So they all go, they bring their parts, their parts bring their demons and they begin to go out of body and do stuff like rituals and send curses and put babies to sleep and all that while the pastor is preaching. And if it's a powerless church, they can build up a cesspool of negativity in that environment over time, especially if the worship is pitiful because powerful worship, even with a, uh, a, a, a teaching and a, a, a headship that has very little understanding of these things. That worship alone can do so much clearing of the atmosphere. But weak prayer, weak worship, and a weak word? Man, you can have churches that get infiltrated that don't look too far off from what you described in the counseling room. And these are things that I think, you know, the church needs to begin to wake up to, Jan. And I so appreciate you bringing it up because these are things I wish I could just tell every preacher I meet, listen to me. <laughs> you don't understand. Just because we talk about survivor issues at Bride Ministries doesn't mean they're not in your church. They are. I promise you. They're in your church. You just don't know why you have the problems you do. And we do. <laughs> That's it. That's the only difference. Anyway. <laughs> getting my buttons pressed here right now 
<laughs> okay. So anyway, Jen, for you, when you walked into that room, was this uh, was was this the first time you had experienced the discerning of spirits gift operating in your life? Well, yes. <laughs> I don't, I, I never thought of it in those terms because uh, I hadn't even received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. Um, well, yes, I had, now that I think about it, because uh, when I was singing in the Spirit, I had received it. I, I received the baptism in this prayer group that I was in every day, and they just, one day, I, didn't, I had been seeking the Lord because I heard the man sing in the Spirit. So I'd been seeking for probably two or three months to get the baptism. And, and one day in our prayer group, they just, they just laid hands on me and prayed for me to get the baptism. But I had not seen any manifestation of that at all. And so when the, when the angels in the back seat showed up, <laughs> which was the first time in my conscious memory that I'd ever seen a, an angelic being of any kind, and then to see the demons the same day, it was like my worldview changed like in 75 miles <laughs> totally <laughs> and um, so i came back to the church and within just a few days um well let me back up a second this this time in history in the church there was like um the church was just on fire for god and revival and wanting revival and everybody was thinking about and praying about the end times and thinking that the trumpet was going to blow at any moment. I mean, the church was really aware that something big time was going on in the spirit. And there were lots of ministries at that time that were having angelic visitations and the, the, the whole spiritual atmosphere was just charged with kind of an, uh, um, you know, a, anticipation of what God was going to do and everybody knew it was something was going to happen nobody knew exactly what but everybody was hoping it was you know either revival or the trumpet was going to blow <laughs> so that was sort of the atmosphere that was going on at the time so um, the Lord just started taking me down this road of warfare like my, the the church that I was living in, this sanctuary became a war zone just within a few days. And uh, I became aware of the, the battle. And I, and I think it was probably that seeing the demons in the spirit that first time that made me realize that there was a battle. Other, you know, before that, I didn't even know there was a battle. So the Lord started teaching me things about about warfare and I didn't know too much at that time except the blood of Jesus I knew that was really important and I knew I could plead the blood of Jesus over myself and over the building and I I couldn't read the Bible at that time because I had been programmed by the Bible so I couldn't even I couldn't even read it I read the book of Revelation was the only thing I read and um, so the Lord um, just started well, just started gradually teaching me more and more things to help me to do the personal battle that was coming against me, the, de the demonic forces and so forth. Of course, the, the cult was starting to understand that I had received Jesus and that I was headed down this road. And I'm sure they, they were not happy and probably sending out plenty of witchcraft prayers and so forth to, you know, to reel me back in. It was about this time that I became, I had my first encounter with, I think, what ended up being voice to skull programming. Mm. And I had, um, I think there were three men. I was aware of them in the, in, a, in the spirit realm. And they showed up in the building and they started asking me a multitude of questions. And I just started answering them. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know what they were doing there. Um, but it was probably within a week I started getting afraid because they were asking me so many questions about my history and so forth. And so I asked the Lord Jesus just to block the door, to not let them come in anymore. And uh, 
So they didn't. But I've had several encounters with voice to skull programming since then. Didn't really know what it was until um, just uh, in 2015 and found some research on it on the internet and finally found out that it was a phenomena that's going on today. But you were experiencing this back in the 90s. 95, yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So uh, were, were you seeing uh, angels in other places? Angels came into um, the sanctuary, my home. Uh, there were windows all around. This was one big, huge room. It was like 55 by 55, huge room. And it had big, huge windows all the way around. And between each window, there was a space, a wall space. And the Lord brought angels in and stationed them around this room. And th that room was, the ceiling was 11 feet tall. And the angels' heads were right at the top of the ceiling. Now, I don't know if those angels were just 11 feet tall or whether he, he pushed them down and made them fit in there or <laughs> I'm not sure. But they were, uh, wow, they were tall, skinny. I didn't see any wings, um, just in kind of white robe kind of things. When they were present, they would come and go. But when they were present in the room, there was a coldness that I would feel. Sometimes I would actually feel the coldness before I would see the angels. But there, it was, I thought of it at the time as deep space. They were coming from deep space somewhere. I, don't, I have no idea if that is true or not. But um, these angels were very stoic. They never looked at me. They never recognized me. They never spoke to me. They were just present during some of the, the deliverance that was happening and the deprogramming. So, um, and I, you know, all of this was so new to me. Uh, maybe in my occult background, I had been used to seeing spiritual beings, but not at a conscious level. And, and certainly not as a Christian. This was my first encounter, really, mm. with uh, angelic beings or any kind of, you know, beings. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. So you said that they'd be there during, you know, deliverance and deep programming work. So how did that begin at the sanctuary? The deep programming, I, I was used as a computer in the cult, and I think it was done through the government programming. And so I started one day, the Lord just started bringing me um, program codes. It would be a title. Mm -hmm. And I would have what, what seemed like uh, tongues. There would be a code in tongues, really false tongues, that I would just start from the beginning and go for sometimes it'd be minutes, sometimes it'd be 10 minutes, sometimes it'd be 20 minutes, different lengths of time. And I would just go through the code, which was like a false tongue. And at the very end of it, then I would start what, what, I, what I came to know as an eraser code. So it would just be like two, two syllables. And it would be like if you had a, a line of type on a typewriter and then you went back and you put X's on top of everything you just typed. Hmm. So I, the, the code would come first and then the eraser code would come on top of that. And then the next code would start. And so every time I would know the name of the code. And then this went on for really all day for about three days. I counted them this morning because I never had counted up to see how many codes there were, but there were 72 codes total that I had 72. remembered. 72. Okay. Yeah. So um, after the three days was up, I didn't, I really didn't keep, um, I kept just brief notes of the titles of the programs. After three days was up, the Lord went back and gave me all the eraser codes for all 72 programs, which I wrote down and, and kept as a, you know, as a file, as a, to remember. And um, 
So this was um, the beginning of my deprogramming from, this was called a beast computer. I had a connection to the beast computer, which I believe at that time was in Belgium. Wow. Well, you and many others. Uh, so the computer uplink issue is something that I think the, the body of Christ is still really struggling with. But folks, let me tell you, I work with many clients that have been interfaced with computers. And guess what? The beast computer is old technology. That guy, they're not really using it. What they're using now is far more complex. And I believe that it's plugged into CERN and other places without question. <laughs> Whatever they're using, it's quantum, it's holographic, it's uh, able to penetrate into the you know, substructure of the creation to an extent in its computations. Uh, and, and, and I don't know everything here and I'm speaking kind of out of the side of my face just by experience, but the, the, the idea of interfacing humans with computers, just look up neural lace. I mean, this is technology now that they're writing about in public forums and stuff that we are running into, but it didn't start five or 10 years ago. It started a long time ago. And unfortunately, they had decades to work under the guise of, pure ignorance no one knew the church is still thinking they're dealing with demons they're not people are uplinked with computers and some of this stuff is actually synthetic intelligences operating like demons but not and just now we're even getting terminology for some of this stuff but again jen i want to thank you for being brave enough to you know tell your story and bring it up so you realize that you were being used as a computer. Uh, why, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what the Lord revealed to you about the beast computer, the interface that you had with it, the purpose of it? Thank you. Well, you know, actually, my programming, I was the computer at that time. Computers weren't even, you couldn't even get a laptop at that time, I don't think, or at least very few people had them at that time. Um, so it was a whole new, a whole new thing for everybody. But, um, I had one night during all this deliverance and the deliverance was, there was so much more going on. I, I had a lot of false Jesus programming that I was fighting. Uh, and even to the point where I had like thousands of Jesus show up one night, all like an army marching toward me. Mm. And, um, the Lord was just delivering me the, of these things as they were coming, coming up. But one night I had, um, I woke up, it was like three o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. And as the phone rang, I woke up. And at the same time I recognized the phone was ringing, I saw a being hovering over my body, like right on top, just hovering a few inches off of my body. And I thought it was Jesus. And I was getting ready to invite him in. And I picked up the phone and it was a woman who was a programmer that I had met several months earlier at a, at a uh, conference and only met her briefly. But she said, what are you doing? She was a friend of a friend of mine and she was at my friend's house at that time. She said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm deprogramming. And she says, well, that being that's getting ready to come into you is not Jesus, it's an antichrist being do not let it in. Jesus already lives inside of you. And she was a programmer for the cult. And when my computer system went down, I found out later that I was a computer for a five state area of occult uh, organizations. So they kept information, data, programs, uh, lists of um, people, affiliates, uh, I don't know really the full extent of what was on there, but it was used in a five state area. And she told me that when it, when, because I was deprogramming, they were coming after her because she was a programmer and she was running for her life at that time. I think she ended up praying for me that night after she hung up, 
because um, I just got some relief from the warfare that was going on around that computer that was going down. And so, uh, you know, I thank the Lord that he woke her up, you know, in the middle of the night. I mean, it was just the timing couldn't have been any more perfect, really, for me. Um, so, you know, this programming, I was by myself this whole time. Nobody knew this was going on. I was, there was one day I uh, looked out the window, my dad was in his truck and he was sitting down across the street on the street level. Um, my mother called me once, which I hadn't heard from her for years and years, and she called at a really critical time. My stepdaughter was living with me because uh, she was finishing her college education, and I would be praying and get the, getting the sanctuary all really nice and holy and pure, and she would walk in and drop her books on the table, and it was like this bomb had gone off because she was going out to school every day, and dealing with secular people and you know she didn't believe she wasn't a believer and then she would come into this atmosphere that i'd cleaned <laughs> and then i'd have to start all over the next day you know <laughs> enough said about that but <laughs> it was a war <laughs> it was just a war so in the in the middle of all this one day i heard the lord say that he wanted me to go to church early. At least I thought it was the Lord. So I got to church a half hour before, uh, it was like a Wednesday night services. And this guy that was in my prayer group that was really very quiet and just kind of a strange, a strange guy, really never met, said hardly anything. I'll call him Joe. He was coming to the church at the same time I got there. And so I followed him into the church. And I heard in my mind him say, follow me. And I'm thinking, well, this must be Jesus. He told me to come to church early. <laughs> so, so I'm following him down the hallway. He goes into a room. And I end up going and opening the door to the room. When I open the door, there's three other men and, and him are in this room now. And they're sitting at a table and they asked me if they could help me and I'm I was just like well, I don't know what to say I'm like no I guess not so that night <clears throat> I just went back to the sanctuary and waited for the service to start and that night when the service started I was on the back at the back of the sanctuary and there was um, we had a guest band there that night and they were all excited because they'd had some angelic visitations. They knew revival was getting ready to start. The Lord was really going to break in and do something powerful in that church. And they didn't know uh, what it was, but they felt like there was a prophet there that might have some knowledge about what the Lord was getting ready to do. And in my spirit, I'm just jumping. I'm like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? You know, and, and uh, so they... <laughs> This is the funniest story. They had these cards, three cards with different pictures on them. And the pastor's sitting on the front row looking forward. And they're on the stage. And so they're holding up these cards saying, if we have a prophet in the house that doesn't want to get up and say anything, you can just give us a signal of which one of these cards would be appropriate. And so they had a card that had a dove on the front of it. <laughs> and so, so I'm on the back row and I'm, making my arms go like a dove and they're so excited i don't have any idea what's going on but they're all excited <laughs> they're all excited about this you know yeah it's the dove it's the dove card the pastor's turning around looking to see who they're talking to you know joe from my support my uh, prayer group is behind me praying in tongues 90 mile an hour and it was irritating <laughs> and so i got up out of my pew went to the other side of the sanctuary sit down and joe follows me over there and he's still praying in tongues not in my mouth so i go back to where i started from <laughs> after the <laughs> after the service was over i felt like the lord told me to go across the hall and wait in a room and so i did i just went over there and i just sat and i waited 
And my, my girlfriend came over and she says, what are you, what are you doing, Jan? And I'm like, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. Well, it's time to go home. Well, the Lord told me to wait here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she goes and, and gets the pastors, uh, the pastor and a prayer team. And they came in and started praying for me for deliverance. And one of my parts, Mary Agnes, the four-year-old, showed up. Oh, man. <laughs> and got quite obstinate about the whole thing. Yeah. So they're praying and praying and praying, and Mary Agnes is just sitting there with her arms folded. It's going nowhere. Mm. Fortunately, the other man in my prayer group that I'd shared with about my multiplicity stepped in, said, Mary Agnes, <laughs> get out of here and get Jan back here right now. <laughs> so, so I came back and was just totally humiliated. I just couldn't believe what had happened. But oh these guys, they could not. I mean, they were trying to cast out demons, and there were no demons coming out anywhere. So my girlfriend was afraid to let me go home by myself, so she invited me to come to her home that night and spend the night. The church, the, uh, the deliverance team, uh, they show up later in the story, but they just gave up and left well enough alone. <laughs> so we went to my girlfriend's house, and um, got, she had two kids, she put them to bed, and I started having spirits that were in the form of animals that were started to come out of me one at a time. And she was praying and she uh, called the guy that had talked to Mary Agnes and they were praying on the phone. And while they prayed, I, these spirits, I think there were 27 of them all together that night, they would come from my, from my belly and they would come up and they would eventually come out of my mouth. But I would be in full body manifestation of these animals. And they were ancient animals. They weren't any kind of animal I would recognize on the earth today. They were ancient. And um, so I just prayed and when they would come out, I just send them up the chimney because I didn't know what to do with them. I just sent them out up the chimney. I thought about that lately and thought, ask the Lord to send angels after them. <laughs> 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 right. So this went on uh, all clear into the early morning hours. And um, so she had a bedroom that her mother prayed in and stayed in and and she put me back there. And I had a, a, a weird dream that night. And it was a, a dream. Um, it was a spiritual dream. When I woke up the next morning, her kids woke up. I had never met her kids. That was the first time I'd known them. And they came to me like they were being, like I was a magnet, like they were drawn to me, which I never had children of my own. So I wasn't real comfortable with kids coming up and wanting hugs at the first time thing in the morning. But they left to go get their breakfast, and I walked into the bathroom and looked in the mirror and saw an antichrist spirit in my eyes, my face. I, he was in me, and I knew he was in me. And uh, first time I ever saw a spirit in me. And um, so after the kids got sent off to school, I had my friend pray, and we got, we got that delivered. Um, it was that day that the Lord gave me my first prayer assignment, mm -hmm. and I started praying in tongues. I was aware that it was for nations like um, Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Laos, uh, in the Far East, a lot of countries in the Far East. It was all about um, communication, uh, uh, trains, planes, transportation of all kinds. Um, and pretty much I prayed for probably about eight hours nonstop in tongues, just, and I knew that I was on assignment and I kind of had a knowing of where I was at, what I was praying for, but in very general terms. Mm. So by the end of that day, my friend who had 
had uh, left work that day to be with me, um, had called back the deliverance team and they showed up that night ready for battle. <laughs> oh man, here we go. Ready for battle. I, I know what it's like to feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. and it's so funny because when you when you're working in a state of ignorance, you I mean it's like you get one fleck of dust off of the uh, you know, the surface and it costs you 2 to 3 hours. And you feel like this big breakthrough. Um, at least that's <laughs> it's worked for me as I was on my own journey. And then I realized, oh my gosh, there's a lot, there's a lot going on here. But anyway, what happened? These guys were ready. Oh boy. Yeah, these guys were ready. And um, they had some prayers, scriptures for me to read, some renunciations. Um, but every time I would try to read anything, I would fall asleep. Boom. <laughs> like, it was like a sleep program. <laughs> Started putting me to sleep every time I'd try to read everything. And I was really, truly trying to cooperate with them because I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> After all those animals came out, I knew I was in big trouble. But... Um, I just couldn't, I couldn't do, I couldn't cooperate with them. I just would fall asleep. And um, they started praying over me and Beelzebub showed up. And it was a real power encounter. Not pretty at all. Mm. And uh, that went on for quite some time. They never did get, they never did get Beelzebub out. In fact, we, got Beelzebub out just a few weeks ago, you and I, <laughs> in my, one of my sessions. Amen for that. Praise Jesus. Amen is right. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, um, it, it was just, it was brutal. It was very brutal. And it was, um, um, I couldn't cooperate. My parts weren't cooperating. Uh, so I when you say it was brutal... Uh, what, what okay i'm just going to say, say this because i think this is one of the things that you actually want people to understand especially because of what we were talking about before we started recording you know just the difference in the approach when you're working with more revelation and understanding of the mechanics of the stuff so just juxtapose that approach that day and what you mean by brutality, like, okay, well, how did they do that? Versus, you know, what you experienced that we did and how that played out. Okay. Well, first off, there were probably six or seven people there. there they were all men. There was one woman. Um, they were praying very loud. They were laying hands on me, which caused me to manifest, uh, especially when Beelzebub showed up, who was very obstinate, very um, do what you want to do. I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to stay. You don't own this territory. You don't own this place. You don't own this person. I mean, very, and chewing the whole time and telling me inside that he was chewing human flesh that he was a flesh eater. And um, it was, it was um, very physical. I mean, they could not hold me down. I was manifesting more than Beelzebub, I'm sure. Um, but mostly they just knew, um, well, they would, they would pray and mostly pray really loud and try to lay hands on. And then they'd go back and regroup and try to talk about it and get a, different strategy and then they'd come back and in the meantime I'd fall asleep because I had this sleep programming going on and so it just went on for probably I 
it's hard to remember, but I would say three or four hours maybe it went on. And nothing was happening. They knew nothing was happening. I knew nothing was happening. Um, Beelzebub finally went back inside, and so things could calm down. And they said, well, we don't think you're ready for this. We're going to send you home now. <laughs> so, so <laughs> so I, I forgot to tell, and I, I'd like to go back and pick up the story because it's kind of important at this point to me, is that while I was at the church and going through all this, the deliverance wasn't working and so forth, and I was hearing this voice, uh, the voice had told me to go stand by a side door. There was a kiosk there. And I was standing there, and there was a black sedan had pulled up to the side door and was waiting. And the voice was telling me to go get in the car, that they were waiting for me. And standing at this kiosk was a little girl. She couldn't have been like six years old. And she was just... She had a piece of paper in her hand and she was just standing there like she was just biding her time or that she was, she never said anything to me. I didn't say anything to her, but she just stood there. And when my girlfriend came up to me and said, you have to come into service now, it's time for the services to start. I said, no, Jesus told me to wait here. And she looked out, she saw the car, and she said, no, 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 you're coming into the service with me. She knew something was going on. Mm. And I mentioned to her, as we're walking into the service, I said, well, I was, I was going to talk to that little girl. She never saw the little girl. And I really, today, I think she may have been an angel. I don't know, but I think she may have been an angel. So when, when after this session of deliverance, at my friend's house and they said that I wasn't ready it was time to go home they were sending me at home in the middle of the night to be by myself in this church and I by this time had recognized that this black car that was waiting out there for me was not a friend <laughs> and um, I was afraid I was very afraid to go home and be alone but the Lord was there, and, you know, I knew he was there to protect me. And the church itself, you couldn't lock the front door. I mean, I literally had no physical protection in that church. Golly. All of my protection came from the Lord. Wow. So that was pretty amazing. So the next service, the next week, uh, was Easter, uh, Good Friday, and I went forward and gave my heart to the Lord so that everybody would know I was a Christian, because after the, what everybody had seen me go through, I knew that nobody would believe that. <laughs> so, so, so I went forward, gave my heart to the Lord again, and um, the pastor called me into his office at the end of the service. Mm-hmm. And I told him, I said, uh, we had a little conversation. And I told him I really felt like the Lord wanted to start revival there. The Lord had been speaking to me about revival. And our revival was in the air. And I really, really, truly thought it was going to start at that church. And I told him that. And he just said, okay, whatever, you know. But he says, you know, Jan, he says, we just can't have this going on in our church. And uh, I said, well, are you telling me not to come back? He says, yeah, I'm, tell, I'm telling you not to come back. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, oh. okay. <laughs> so, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I didn't go back. But, you know, the Holy Spirit was on me. I didn't have any. I, I knew that I was in his hands and, and that everything was going to be okay. And um, I, I always felt really bad because I really do think the Lord wanted to start a revival in that church. The Pensacola revival, which started in an Assembly of God church, started, uh, well, this happened in March, in, May, in uh, June that year, the revival started in Pensacola. And uh, so revival was in the air. It was everywhere. 
Now, when we w- worked on the Beelzebub issue, how did you experience that work? <laughs> well, I had done some work uh, before our session and found a little part named Agnes, and she was in a box. So I'd gotten her out of a box, and I had learned how you invite Jesus in, and then Jesus talks to the part. So I invited Jesus in, and he gave Agnes a yo-yo. <laughs> And he was teaching her how to use the yo-yo. So when we came to our session, I told you that I had met Agnes and that Jesus had given her a yo-yo, but the yo-yo was too, the string on the yo-yo was too long and she couldn't really operate it too well. So you told Agnes that she could step into Jesus and grow up. And so... (laughs) I see Jesus and Mary Agnes facing each other. Jesus has got a hold of the yo-yo, and Mary Agnes has a string, and Jesus is trying to pull her closer, and she's got her feet planted. (laughs) And is is not uh, being pulled toward Jesus. And at that time, I I saw or recognized that this that there was a spirit inside of her. And I just started praying, and I'm sure you did too. Beelzebub came out, lo and behold. (laughs) So he had been inside of Agnes, inside of a box, inside of my system. And you made some comment about an anchor, something about an anchor uh, in the system, which I I don't fully understand. Well, Exactly. So it, when a ship docks off the coast, they will drop an anchor off the side of the ship and it's weighted on a chain. And so when the anchor goes into the ground on the, or the seabed, when the waves come in, the waves can't push the ship away from where it has dropped its anchor. It will kind of stay in that area until they bring the anchor back up onto the ship and then they can sail off. Well, the uh, entities can be kind of like the ship. They'll drop an anchor and there'll be an anchor point. And when that anchor hits the anchor point, the waves may come. Now that wave may be people praying leave 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 in the name of jesus get out in the name of jesus leave so the waves and the wind start blowing but because the ship is anchored to an anchor point it doesn't move it just kind of stays there so the anchor point typically has to do with legalities rights covenants contracts agreements hidden things and because they love to hide these things and so what you had in your situation was that a part was thoroughly interfaced with Beelzebub. She, she had an agreement with Beelzebub, consciously or not. She may have not even made that decision. She may have been split with the express purpose of giving Beelzebub an anchor point. And I'm not sure if we got that answer or not, but this is kind of how it works. And so then in the demonization, the ritualization or some process, that part is then hidden in a box, in your case. So by hiding the anchor point, you don't find it easily. It's concealed. And so you go after the target, which is this entity, but because of the hidden anchor point, you just rock it a little while. And you can rock it for an hour or two hours or three hours. But with that anchor point, it's just not going to leave. And the problem with a lot of these bad guys is that they're arrogant and they know that. So then they'll begin to be cocky and say, I don't have to leave. This is my house. I have rights here. And you yell louder and they yell louder. (laughs) But... Here in your situation, well, you know, we're working with Jesus. We find the part. 
Now we see, aha, that's where the anchor is. So then we separate out the anchor. You know, in other cases, I may have that part be the one to come to the surface and go through my renunciation with me and have the part say the prayer that I cut ties with Beelzebub instead of the presenter. That anchor point, once it's addressed, that thing breaks very quickly. Anyway. (laughs) I love that. And, you know, Daniel, one of the things I love the most about working with you is that Jesus is always in the middle of everything. And he is in, he is so delightful and he's, he treats every part completely differently. And he's so creative in the way that he deals with parts. And it's so healing. Um, It's just Jesus like you never hear about in mm. church. <laughs> mm, mm, in regular mm. church. It's so wonderful. It is. So if we have time, I would like to tell one more story. You brought up CERN earlier. Absolutely. <laughs> I had been, um, this has just happened since I've been working with Daniel, but um, the Lord had been highlighting uh, the words connect the dots. And sometimes he does this with me. There'll be um, normal words or phrases that everybody's using, but I'll just have a knowing that there's something spiritual on it that's not good and that the enemy is using it in his kingdom. And so that had been happening. I'd been getting these words connect the dots. So I brought it to Daniel and I said, Daniel, I don't, I don't know what's on this, but there's, it's not good. So he started praying and, uh, I started seeing, and I saw the uh, the statue of Shiva outside of CERN. And uh, at the same time, I saw that. I think I had a knowing that there that there was they were getting ready to interface um, programming of survivors with internet, so that they would they would program those two things together. There'd be a more direct connection somehow. So uh, as soon as I got that and and Daniel, I heard him powering up. I think this might have only been our third session or something. It was really early on in our work together. So Daniel's powering up, and I'm looking at the statue of CERN. And Daniel asked me to ask Jesus uh, what he should do. And Jesus said, cut her arms off. I'm like, yes! Win! <laughs> I love that! I was so excited! <laughs> now, this was not the Jesus I was used to. <laughs> but yes, Daniel was very excited. And so he starts praying, and I'm... I'm like, I want to see this. I want to see what's going on. So, and I'm seeing in the spirit myself moving toward this statue of CERN. It's like a road in front of me and I'm moving toward the statue and off past the statue is coming this horde of demons. I mean, a horde of demons and they're running down this road toward us. And I felt the Holy Spirit like grab my collar and jerk me back. He said, you're going to get run over. (laughs) And so so I'm back on the side of the road now, and Daniel is going to work on these demons. Oh, my goodness. And, I mean, the fur is flying. (laughs) So pretty soon, Daniel stops the warfare, and I see right in the middle of this road this Shiva on its knees, forehead on the ground, Jesus is standing at its head, and it has no arms. I was like, oh my gosh. (laughs) I had never seen warfare like that before. And I heard the Lord say, every knee will bow. That's right. And boy, that went deep, deep into my spirit. What a truth. What a warrior. (laughs) 
you know, just another Thursday. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, these stories are so good anecdotally. Um, most of them I actually forget because, like, from my perspective, it's, I, I mean, it's just every day. And I, I can't wait for the day to arise where, you know, and, and I think it's coming where, where, where people stop looking at the work that like I've done and, and, and the work that we're doing with me and friends of mine, uh, you, you know, in this field, in this area of getting people set free in the name of Jesus and, 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 and looking at us like we're anathema, like, oh, oh, Dan Duvall. Oh, yeah, I've heard about him. Isn't, you know, it's just like that's the attitude that we've had for years and years. I, I see the Lord changing that. But, you know, I can't wait for the day where, you know, other ministers are just like, oh, yeah, that is just another Thursday. It's like, oh, yeah, we're chopping these guys up, we're, we're spitting out their bones. I mean, it's just, this is regular. <laughs> this, is, this is just Christian living, you know, where the Christian living section of the bookstore talks about these guys getting their arms chopped off. It's like, yeah, Christian living, you know, right next to the devotional book. And how to raise your baby, you know, the first three months, chop their heads off, like right there in the middle. I, I'm really looking forward to this day because it's available in Jesus. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, you know, I'm demonstrating it and we have people that are testifying and, you know, way more people that are not than people that are because so many people, they get their testimony, their breakthrough and their victory. And they know they can't share this in their church, their local church. It's like, they wouldn't even understand what happened, but it's a big deal. One day, <laughs> we're going to graduate people and, 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 you know, the world's going to be a better place for it. Anyway, that's my short appeal. Uh, Jan, you've done such a great job. Is there anything else that you wanted to share in this particular uh, segment of your story? Thank you, Dan. No, you know, I just echo what you've said is that through 35 years, it, it's been hard not having a church that I can go to that, that can hear the story, can help the story, even believe, believes the story. But I'm like you. I think, I think the day is coming. I think the Lord is going to open up, uh, the spiritual realm in such a way that we won't be able to ignore it anymore. We will have to enter in and be part of it, be part of his plan. And I thank you, Daniel Duvall, for being that forerunner, for being that person that has to listen to all the comments and just keeps marching on anyway. I appreciate it. I told somebody in my group one time, that I've been waiting 35 years for God to raise up in the ball to help me. <laughs> so thank you, Lord. And thank you, Daniel. Well, folks, there it is. We will be back. So until next time, God bless and God speak. You've been listening to Discovering Truth with Dan Duvall. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like our video, and share this with friends. This podcast is a production of Bride Ministries International. Visit our website at brideministriesinternational.com to enjoy the Bride Ministries Church, the Bride Ministries Institute, free resources, and to support us financially.